Now, when we come to chapter 4, we naturally ask the question, what happened to the church? You don't find it from chapter 4 through the rest of the book of Revelation. There's no mention of the church except when you get to the invitation at the end, which is general and hasn't anything to do with the chronology of the book. From here on, you won't find the word church mentioned. Now, up to this point, the word church has occurred again and again. In fact, 19 times. Now, the church goes off the air. No mention of it. And it's gone off the air. Why? Because it went up in the air. It was caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And the church has gone to heaven. That's what's happened to it. And it took place, as I say, during that Philadelphia period. And that thing that continued on was just an organization. And it'll go through the Great Tribulation. And we're finally going to hear it called a great harlot. Boy, is that frightful. That's the most frightful picture in the Bible, is the 17th chapter of Revelation. And we're going to see the church again, yes, but she's not a church. She's a bride, bride adorned for a husband. So that brings us now to this final division in this book. Now, you remember that he had said very definitely John was given the division of it. He passed it on to us. We ought not to miss it. He says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That is, metatata, after these things. And so when we come here to this book, what do we have? He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Now, that's the sound of the trumpet that calls the church up, you see. And whose voice is it? The voice of Christ. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. What kind of things now? We'll get to that over here in verse 1. But the things that are after these things, well, after what things? Well, the church, after the church has completed its earthly run and it is caught up, now we're coming to these things, metatata, after these things, after the church things. Now, will you notice, and I'd like to call your attention here to several striking facts that make it self-evident that we advance to a new division in chapter 4. And the climate and conditions have changed radically. And these are the things which must be hereafter. And they are in the Greek, metatauta, after these things. We begin now the last major division of the book. And what happened to the church? Well, it's not in the world. Up to chapter 4, there were 19 references to the church in the world. In fact, the subject of chapters 2 and 3 has been entirely devoted to the church in the world. Now, from chapter 4 to the end of Revelation, the church is never mentioned in connection with the world. The final and lone reference is the concluding testimony after the world's little day has ended. In chapter 22, verse 16, Christ said, you remember, to his own in John 17, 16, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And he also said, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And now the scene shifts to heaven in chapter 4, and definitely so. And since the church is still the subject, we're going to follow. And where are we going to find the church? It's moved to its new home, heaven. And how did the church get to heaven? That's a good question. Paul gives the answer. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And he defines the operation in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye and at the last trump... For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, faith today places the sinner on the launching pad 
in the guided missile of the church, and from whence he shall go to meet the Lord in the air. The saints enter the open door to heaven. The church is with Christ. Christ is in heaven directing the events of the great tribulation period that we're going to see when we begin at chapter 6. Now, we have a third striking fact. The church is not a name, but a definition of those who've trusted Christ in this age. Now, this is something that we need to get fixed in our mind because our thinking today is really muddled. And it's this. The word for church is ekklesia. Kaleo means to call, ek out of. It means the church or a group of people called out of the world. Now, when the church arrives at its destination and is called out and arrives in heaven, it loses the name by which it was known in the world, a called out body. And there are other terms now used to describe it. We're going to see it in this chapter as 24 elders, representative of the church in heaven. And then we're going to see the church in heaven as a bride coming down to her new home, the new Jerusalem. Now, the apostate organization, which bears the ecclesiastical terminology, it continues on in the world, and it's not hereafter given the name and title of church either. It's called the Great Harlot. And boy, let me tell you, that's bad. That's frightful. It was the late Dr. George Gill told us one time in class. He says, you know, at the time of the rapture, there are going to be some churches that they're going to meet the next Sunday after the rapture, and they won't miss a member. They'll all be there. Why? Because it's the church of Laodicea. Now, there's a fourth striking fact. The judgments, beginning in chapter 6, would not be in harmony with the gracious provision and promise that God has made to the church. If the church remained in the world, it would frustrate the grace of God. You see, we have been promised to be delivered from judgment. And then finally, the fifth, to continue on from chapter 3 to chapter 4 without recognizing the break is to ignore the normal and natural division in the book of Revelation which has been given to us. The things thou hast seen, the things that are, and the things that will be after these things. And the last division here is entered with all of its judgment and wrath, and it's well to keep in our perspective that Jesus Christ is central and he's directing all events as he brings them to a successful but a determined conclusion. There is in the midst of the throne a lamb. And he's a lamb because he died for the sins of the world. And he's the one that's going to judge. Now, when we get over here to chapter 4, and we just barely got a foot in the door, and I'd like to read my translation of the first verse, "...after these things, metatauta, I saw, and behold, a door set open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, a voice as of a trumpet speaking with me and saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must come to pass after these things." Metatauta, used twice here, apparently... John was afraid the Amalanalists would miss it, so he said it twice here in this particular place. Now we are going with the church to heaven. We'll see the throne of God, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures in this chapter. We find that the scene now changes to heaven, and since he's speaking to the church, we assume the church has gone to heaven because it's no longer in the world. We don't see it anymore in the world. It is concluded its earthly career, and that is the division that John had said. He was told to write the things which thou hast seen, the vision of the glorified Christ, the things that are, those are church things, and then the things that shall be after these things, metatauta, that is, after the church things. Now, we've come to that, because this verse opens with metatauta, and it closes with metatauta, the first verse of chapter 4 here. And I'm reading it again in my translation. It's an important verse. 
after these things, metatauta, I saw, and behold, a door set open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, a voice as of a trumpet, speaking with me and saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must come to pass after these things, metatauta. Couldn't miss it unless you just really wanted to, or you had a system of interpretation that this verse would be just a little embarrassing for you. After these things both opens and closes, and so it's very important. And that repetition certainly lends great emphasis and importance to the phrase. Now, after the church things, the church is concluded, we now have a scene that shifts from earth to heaven. And so radical change. And the Word of God, though, describes these personages, activities in heaven as normally as it described them on earth. There's no strain or involvement in superstition or mystery. The bridge over the great gulf is passed with ease and a reverent restraint. Only the Holy Spirit could describe things in heaven with as much ease as he describes things on earth. What would have happened if a man had written this book? Why, you know, the minute that he got you to heaven, he'd have the wildest sort of things to say. And you say, how do you know that? Well, read the books that are out today on this type of thing that try to describe the overworld and the underworld and the unseen world. They're rather startling, you see, rather amazing. In fact, that's about the way you can determine what is false today is that type of approach, this awful obsession that even Christians have with demons and with the devil. I have no truck with that outfit at all. Somebody says, why haven't you written a book on it? Well, at first I have to be very frank and say I thought I would. And then when so many of them started coming out, and they're all as wild as a March hare. They all deal with the sensational. But you don't have that here. It's just we move to heaven and the scene is an awe-inspiring scene, but it lacks that which man would put here, of course. Now, the important thing is here the church is not seen under the familiar name it had in the world, but is now the priesthood of believers with the great high priest. The heavenly scenes and creatures greet us in this section before our attention is drawn to the earth, where at the beginning of the great tribulation the four horsemen are to ride. Now, Christ is viewed here in his threefold office in these next two chapters of prophet, priest, and king. And he's worshipped as God because he is God. Now, will you note, after these things, what things again? Church things. The church has concluded its earthly career, and we've moved into a new phase altogether. Now, John says, I saw. That's the eye gate. He says, I heard. That's the ear gate. This is still a television program we're looking at, you see. This is the first great television program. And we've had a wonderful treat in our day to a television program taken from the moon. But that's nothing. That's just like going out in our backyard and getting a picture. Now, here is a television program from heaven. I don't know why, but this ought to interest believers a great deal and not cause us to take off like a skyrocket in some wild sort of dreamy stuff. Heaven is a pretty real place, and there's a lot of reality there. And we ought not to get uptight over this scene now that's before us. Let's all just handle it in a normal way. But I can't help but get excited about it all. He says, I saw and I heard, what? A door that was set open. Now, this is one of the four open doors in the book of Revelation. Back in the third chapter, in verse 8, when he's speaking to the church in Philadelphia, you remember he says, I've set before thee an open door. We believe that that's an open door to the Word of God and an open door to getting out the Word of God. And that's the motto of the Through the Bible program, that verse and the one that is before it. He openeth, and no man shut it. I tell you, he's a wonderful Savior today, and we hold to this verse. 
Then you have the open door of invitation. That's in the third chapter here. We saw last time, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock, and if man will open the door, that's the door to your heart. Now we have an open door to heaven here. And then when you get over to the 19th chapter, verse 11 of the book of Revelation, you're going to see a door open in heaven again. It's been open all the time. It wasn't open then. It just had been open. He says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, that's the door that is open, and Christ comes out from there. And he comes out in the end of the great tribulation to put down all of the unrighteousness and rebellion against God and establish his kingdom. Now, John did not see this door opening, as the authorized version suggests. This door was open all the time. And it's the door through which believers have come to God for over 1,900 years. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And he also said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The open door to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also is the one that comes to the door of your heart. That's a wonder and the glory of it all. Now, we enter in by faith. And in modern terminology, we might express it thus. Faith puts us on the launching pad of the church, which is Christ, and at the rapture we go through the door like a guided missile. Not just shot out in space going nowhere, but if man can hit the target of the moon, I don't think the Lord Jesus will have any problem getting his church into heaven. Now, the invitation here is, come up hither. Now, that's heaven's invitation to John. And it is an invitation that's to all of the fellowship that know Christ as Savior. John, you remember, said that in 1 John 1, 3. He says, "...that which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ." Now, he says here, "...we heard it and we saw it, and we declare it unto you." John says, I'm letting you know this so you can have fellowship with him also. And one of these days, you're going up through that open door. Now, we have here the voice as of a trumpet speaking. Now, a trumpet doesn't talk. All these devotees of jazz talk about that Louis Armstrong's trumpet talks. And they talk about, what's the name of this fellow in New Orleans? Al Hurt, I think, is his name. Jazz King. And they say their trumpets talk. Well, these addicts on jazz can say that, but they're just using a cymbal. A trumpet never talks. His voice is like a trumpet. And that's the voice that Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. May I say that that is a definite statement concerning the rapture. When anybody tells you the word rapture is not in the Bible, the word caught up is harpazo, and it can mean caught up, and I like that better than any other, but it can mean rapture. It can mean to snatch up. And I think that Hal Lindsay today calls it the great snatch, the rapture. Now, that's good for these young people today. I guess that's their vocabulary, but I don't go for that. I just like the word caught up, and it means rapture. And if you don't like the word rapture, then call it harpazo. That's what Paul called it. Won't mean anything to you, but just call it that. But that's what the word means. Caught up, and its voice will be like a trumpet. And that pulled John up. It's going to pull you up someday. Pull me up. Verse 2, And he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit. and Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, at once, 
this word immediately, at once, straightway, he says, I found myself in the Spirit. In other words, that idea of being caught up, you remember that Paul spoke about in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And a twinkling of an eye is pretty brief, and some psychologist has measured it. And he considers a twinkle not the going down of the eye, but the going up of the eyelid. Now, that, my friend, is reducing it to a frying point, but it's one thousandth of a second. Now, that's how quick it's going to be. Immediately, straightway, at once, he says, I found myself in the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is still leading and guiding him. And behold, a throne set in heaven. It was already there. He sees it for the first time. And one sitting on the throne at once, you see. And he's in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is guiding him into new truth here, showing him things to come. And a throne is set in heaven. Now, it gives us the place, directs our attention to the center of attraction that is there. The throne represents the universal sovereignty and rulership of God. It means that he is in control and that GHQ, headquarters of this universe, is in heaven. It's not in Washington or London or Moscow or any place down here. May I say to you that this is the picture that we have in the Word of God. And I'm just toying here with the idea whether I ought to turn and read several passages concerning this in the Old Testament. Let me just give one. Psalm 11, 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of man. A throne in heaven. And everywhere you turn, in Psalm 110, 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The throne of grace now becomes a throne of judgment. And that's another reason for me saying very definitely that the church is gone. Because if the church was still here, Christ has left the place of intercession and he's come now to the place of judgment. That'd be the wrong place for him for the church. Now, will you notice the picture that's given to us in verse 3? And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. All we see is color here, beautiful color like precious jewels, and you don't get a picture of God at all. <laughs> he just never has been photographed. And this is the picture. And our attention is directed to the one that's seated on the throne. Although he's God the Father, we should understand this is to be the throne of the triune God. And you have here, God the Father is mentioned in verse 3. He that sat on the throne, like unto Jasper. We'll see more about that. And God the Holy Spirit. He's already been mentioned. And he'll be mentioned again in verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then God the Son. And I probably should then read verse 5 of the next chapter. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So what we have before us here is the Trinity here upon the throne. And John could distinguish no form of a person on the throne, only the brilliance and brightness of precious stones. Now, the jasper stone, that is the stone that's identified in the breastplate of the high priest. It was first in the foundation of the New Jerusalem, as we shall see later on. It was first in the wall of the New Jerusalem. We'll see that later on. It was a many-colored stone with purple predominating. Some identify it with a diamond. And by the way, it was in the breastplate of the high priest, and that represents little Benjamin, and he was the son of my right hand. And that's where Christ ascended 
and took his place at the right hand of God. What a picture we have here. And then you have the next stone is the sardine stone. And that's the sixth stone in the foundation of the new Jerusalem. Pliny says it was discovered in Sardis from which it derived its name. Sardine stone doesn't mean it came from a little fish. It came from Sardis. And its color was a fiery red. The first stone sets forth the holiness of God. The second, the wrath or judgment of God. But the sardine stone also was the first in the breastplate. And it represented Reuben, the firstborn. And may I say to you, Christ is the Son, the firstborn from the dead. What a picture. And there's a rainbow. Now, the Greek word is iris. It can mean also halo. With the rainbow, here it's polychrome. Here is emerald, which is green. And after the judgment of the flood, the rainbow appeared as a reminder of God's covenant not to destroy the earth again with a flood. And it appears here before the judgment of the great tribulation as a reminder that a flood will not be used in judgment. Green is the color of the earth. And the suggestion is that of a backer in wrath, Remember mercy, and God will do that. Now we are introduced to the 24 elders. Let me read verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now there's been a great deal of speculation as to who the elders are. The word elders, presbyteros. And, of course, the word Presbyterian comes from that. A little girl came home from Sunday school one day. It was a Presbyterian Sunday school. And the mother asked her what they talk about. And she said, well, they talked about heaven. And so the mother said, well, what did they say about it? Well, said the teacher said that there were only 24 Presbyterians there. Well, may I say to you, friends, I doubt whether there are going to be 24 there or not, because I was in that church a long time. But I ought not to say that, because I know a lot of wonderful saints of God that were in that church, and they certainly were a blessing to my heart for many years. So I was just kidding when I said that. But the 24 elders are representatives. Elders are representatives. Israel had them. This was clearly understood by those people in that day. These are representative of the churches. They were appointed in the churches to rule and represent the entire church. That's in Titus 1, 5. So I say it here categorically and really dogmatically, although I could go into all kinds of books and you can get all kinds of interpretations. Here is the church in heaven. Now they're clothed in white raiment. That's the righteousness of Christ. And they got crowns of gold. And that indicates the church will rule with Christ, and also they've received rewards, you see. That's when the judgment, the Bema judgment, takes place. The judgment seat of Christ. Verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, the tense here is present tense, and it's taking place right there and then. Lightnings and thunders, that always precedes a storm down in Texas, and I think that's what it means here, that judgment is coming. And voices were heard, but that's not going to be judgment in a haphazard way. It will be directed by the one on the throne. And the seven spirits of God is a clear reference to the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, you have the four living creatures. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts. They are not beasts, but living creatures, full of eyes before and behind. Now, the sea of glass denotes the appearance and not the material. This sea is before the throne of God, and it's another indication that the emphasis is not on mercy, but on judgment. This sea represents the holiness and righteousness of God. 
And we're told, "...into the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints." The placid sea indicates the position of rest to which the church has come. No longer is she the victim of the storms of life. No longer is she out there on the sea. Now, the four beasts are literally four living creatures. The Greek word is zoa. We get our word zoo from that. And the emphasis is not upon the bestial character, but on the vital character. And they're full of eyes behind and all the way around. These speak of alertness and awareness. They're alive. And they resemble both the cherubim and seraphim. Now, friends, we're here in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. We're down to the seventh verse, and this is the scene in heaven, and we have seen that there are some very interesting things to behold in heaven, and that the golden streets are really not the most important thing after all. Now, he says here in verse 7, "...and the first beast," and I should change that, the first living creature, the word as we saw last time, was zoa. And it doesn't mean a wild beast, as we might think. Now, we will have that when we get to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. That's a different word, and that's a different type of beast. These are just living creatures. And as we said last time, the emphasis is not upon the bestial but upon the vital, the fact they're living. And we're told here, the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face as a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now, we attempted to identify these with the gospel that they represent, and I believe rather accurately, although that's questioned a great deal today, that the first gospel presents the Lord Jesus as the king. He's born a king. He lives a king. He dies a king. He's raised as a king. He's coming again as a king. Everything he does in the gospel of Matthew does as a king. And you'll remember that God said of the tribe of Judah was like a lion. And the king, the ruler, would come out of that, that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh came. Now, the second was like a calf or an ox. That's the beast of burden and the servant animal domesticated. And in the Gospel of Mark, Christ is presented as the servant. No genealogy there. When a man comes to mow your lawn or to wash dishes for you, You don't ask him who his pop and mama was. What difference does it make? You want to know whether he can do the job. That's the gospel of Mark, the ox. And then you have the third living creature is the face of a man. And the third gospel presents the Lord Jesus as the Son of Man. Luke does that. Then the fourth living creature is like a flying eagle, and that communicates the deity of Christ as seen in the gospel of John. Now, these living creatures also represent the animal world. In fact, all living creatures on this earth, as suggested by Godet. The lion represents wild beasts. The ox represents domesticated animals. And the eagle represents birds. And man here is the head of all creation. Now, somebody says, well, what about fish? Well, in the new heavens and the new earth, there's not going to be any more sea. And since there's no sea, you won't need any fish, unless they're going to live on dry land. And reptiles, the serpent, won't be there either to introduce sin, as he did at the beginning. Now, let me read verse 8. "...and the four living creatures had each of them six wings about them." And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. Now, these six wings immediately 
correspond to the seraphim in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And I'm sure that when you read that verse, you think of the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And instead of that they had, it means having. This is present tense. This is where the action is, and it's taking place, and it's in present tense. And again, the thing that they say monotonously, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, that's the same refrain of the seraphim of Isaiah, the sixth chapter again. Now, which was and is and is coming, that refers to Christ. He identified himself. You'll remember at the very beginning of this book, in just that way, he said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come. And so he's identified for us. We don't need to speculate in places like this. Now, in verses 9 and 11, let me read now the remainder of this chapter. And when those living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." Now, this is the first great worship scene that we have here in heaven. And we find that it's a constant thing. When here, that opens this section, and when, it should be, and whensoever. And that indicates that this is a continual act of worship. In other words, praise and adoration is the eternal activity of God's creatures in heaven. The creature worships the Creator as the triune God, holy, holy, holy. And worship is the activity of heaven. Now, may I say this? I have a sermon that I used to preach quite a bit years ago. I haven't preached it in years. And the title of the sermon is, Why Do You Want to Go to Heaven? You hear a great many people say, not everybody talking about heaven is going to heaven. Well, there's a better question than that that is suggested by that song. And that is, why do you want to go to heaven? What's the idea? To miss hell? Well, I don't think that's an unworthy motive myself. But may I say to you, if you go to heaven, you're going to find yourself either getting down on your face or up off of it worshiping the triune God, and especially the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you find worship boring down here, and you're not interested in worshiping the Lord Jesus and expressing your heart's desire to him, then why in the world do you want to go to heaven, friends? Because they're going to spend a lot of time up there worshiping him. Now, we are told here that the crowns, of the church here are laid at Jesus' feet as an act of submission and worship. I think, very frankly, that we're going to get embarrassed wearing a crown around. (laughs) So many people talk about there's going to be a crown for them over there. Well, I think that, frankly, that after we wear it around a little and the new wears off, we're going to get embarrassed because what in the world are we doing wearing a crown? The only one worthy up there is the Lord Jesus. So we're going to put it at his feet. That is, if we get a crown to begin with. Now, you notice it's, O Lord, thou hast created all things. Now, did you notice here, and Dr. Walford, in his very excellent book on Revelation, calls attention to this, and I want to call attention to it. I think it's important. If you'll notice that the living creatures here They give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne. They worship him for his attributes, because he is who he is. But the four and twenty elders represent the church. And they worship him not just because of his attributes, but because of what he's done. 
And here they worship him as creator, but they worship him because thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, in other words, the church comes out of this little earth, and this is God's creation. And they join in the worship because he created this earth down here. And Genesis 1.1 is accurate, and then the church believes it. And where it says here, it's created for thy pleasure, it actually should be because of thy will. This is very important to see, that the reason that God created this earth and things are as they are, because it was in his plan and purpose. Now, I don't understand a great deal that he's doing. I don't understand a great deal about this universe that I live in. But I do know this, that it's created this way because that's the way he wanted it. He's in charge, and we're to worship him because he created this little earth. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he created me. He could have forgot all about me, and I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad I was in the plan and purpose of God. I'm glad he created. And so we worship him because of that.